presentation which follows was intended to be given at Edinburgh on the 14th of November 2020 as the Stair Society's annual lecture. Because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions, the presentation has been pre-recorded for delivery online. My hope is that it will be seen as a harbinger event for the celebration of the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott, which happens next year in 2021. My Lady President of the Stair Society, fellow members and guests, Sir Walter Scott, Law and Imagination. Sir Walter Scott was not ashamed to call himself an Edinburgh lawyer. He worked in the law from 1786, when he was apprenticed to his father, a writer to the Signet, until 1832, when he died still in office as Sheriff of Selkirk. In between, Scott practised as an advocate for 14 years, and he held office as a principal clerk of the Court of Session thereafter for 25 years. 46 years in the law, but Scott left no account of his personal involvement with any identifiable case except two, and only one of these, the eviction of Invenenti, is explicitly connected by him with his literary output. His involvement in the Invenenti case as a law apprentice is described in the introduction to the 1829 Magnum edition of Rob Roy. The Invenenti case epitomises the fusion of law and imagination in Scott's life, or at least their intimate coexistence. And if Scott's account can be relied on, it is foundational. Scott writes that he superintended the service of a summons of removing on the Invenenti tenants he continues, and thus it happened oddly enough that the author first entered the romantic scenery of Loch Catrin, of which he may say that he has somewhat extended the reputation. It was the, quote, romantic scenery of Loch Catrin, on Scott's account so unlike the, quote, dry and barren wilderness of forms and conveyances through which his indentures otherwise led him, that came to inspire the Lady of the Lake, 1810. And it was, it was the success of this poem and its Highland setting that induced Scott, he says, quote, to attempt something of the same kind in prose. The same kind of thing in prose was the novel Waverley, 1814, first of the historical fictions that gave a new direction to Western literature. The title of this talk, Law and Imagination, comes from Scott's introduction to the 1830 magnum edition of The Lay of the Last Minstrel, where Scott describes his decision in 1806 to give up practice as an advocate after 14 years at the bar. Quote, I became sensible that the time had come when I must either buckle myself resolutely to, quote, the toil by day, the lamp by night, renouncing all the Delilahs of my imagination, or bid adieu to the law and hold another course. There was no adieu. Scott remained a lawyer, though not a practicing advocate. He continued to have ambition in the law and occasional mild regrets. The novels are full of law and lawyers, but for the most part, there is no explicit cause and effect. For real life connections, we have to make do with hints, coincidences, and educated guesses. Now, this presentation discusses four novels and four records connected with Scott's legal career. The legal records are one, the Civil Law Thesis for admission to the Faculty of Advocates, 1792, two, 
the Scots Law lecture notes made by Scott during the session 1791-1792 updated to 1806. Three, an article in the Edinburgh Annual Register for 1808 about reform of the Court of Session. And four, as already indicated, Scott's account in 1829 of his involvement in the Invenanti eviction. The novels are Red Gauntlet, The Bride of Lammer Moor, Anne of Geierstein and Rob Roy, titles chosen to illustrate the variety of ways in which Scott's fiction connects with his own experiences in the law and with his politico-legal preoccupations. Reference is made to original versions and to revised versions as published in the Magnum or Collected Works edition known as the Waverley Novels, 1829 to 1832. Red Gauntlet, 1824, though set in the mid-1760s, is semi-autobiographical. It gives us two facets of young Walter Scott on the threshold of his career around 1790. The entrant advocate Fairford negotiates between the law, represented by his writer to the signet father, and imagination, represented by his friend Latimer. Latimer abandons the legal path for literature and self-discovery. Fairford Jr., like Scott at the same stage, lives at home in the shop, as he calls it, his father's house, which doubles as a law office. Fairford Sr. may be a Presbyterian, but he has Jacobite clients, just as Scott Sr. had. Like Latimer in Red Gauntlet, Scott, quote, loved to hear the stories which the Helan gentlemen tell of those troublous times. It was from his father's Jacobite clients, notably Alexander Stewart of Invernahyle, that young Walter Scott heard tales of Rob Roy and of the Rising of 1745. These tales are fictionalized for the novels. Red Gauntlet, Chapter 11, introduces an old 45 man, Peter Maxwell of Summertrees, who escaped from the Redcoats by slipping his shackles and rolling down Erickston Bray near Moffat. The escapade can be sourced to pleading paper number 17 of process in the Invenenti case. Quote, Donald McLaren, that's Don McLaren of Invenenti, had been concerned in the rebellion of 1745-1746, but on the road to trial at Carlisle, he made his escape by rolling himself down Erickston Bray near Moffat. This paper is dated, lodged in court, 3rd of March, 1789, so we know that it was drafted in Scott Senior's shop, while the future author of Red Gauntlet was apprenticed there. Scott Senior was acting in the case on his own account and for Stuart of Invernahyle, Donald McLaren's one-time senior officer. Red Gauntlet lists the college subjects studied for admission to the bar in the 1760s, civil law and Scots law, of course, also metaphysics and history. Little had changed. From the autumn of 1789, Scots classes included Professor Dougal Stewart's moral philosophy course and universal history presented by the practicing advocate Alexander Fraser Teitler, later Lord Woodhouse Lee, now on screen. The latter explained the connection between law and society through history. The idea of the mutual contingency of Scots law and Scottish society stamped the novelist's thinking for the rest of his life. Scotch historiography taught the past as organic development by stages. To this can be traced a narrative framework characteristic of the Waverley novels. 
Walter Scott's insight is that the convulsions which afflicted his own country in the century before his birth represented rapid but asymmetric change resulting in the simultaneous existence of conflicting forms and ideals of society, governance, justice and virtue. Scott's genius exploits the dramatic potential through fictional characters representing both sides of the argument and its resolution. Red Gauntlet dramatizes the final act of the Jacobite challenge. The novelist's preoccupations extend to marginalized groups left behind in the progress of history. Red Gauntlet has repeated references to Scotland's last feudal serfs, slaves as the law called them, the colliers and salters. Was this another creative debt that the novelist owed to his prosaic parent? It was Scott Senior who acted for the Colliers in the petition to Parliament, which resulted in a first step to emancipation by the Colliers Act 1775, and he ended up £180 out of pocket. So, young Alan Fairford in Red Gauntlet says of his fictional father, quote, he has courage enough to defend a righteous cause with hand and purse, and to take the part of a poor man against his oppressor without fear of consequence to himself. The final stage of admission to the bar involved disputation on a Latin thesis, followed by a short speech in Latin on part of the text. From 1729, titles for disputation were assigned in sequence from Justinian's Digest. The title assigned to Alan Fairford in Red Gauntlet is Title VI, Book 18, De Periculo et Commodo Re Venditae, The Passing of the Risk in Sale. This was the title of the actual thesis presented by Intrant George Wallace in 1754, that is, ten years or more before the action of Red Gauntlet. Why the anachronism? Two things possibly recommended the title to the novelist. It treats of the merchantable quality of wine, and there was no chance of treading on toes, for Wallace had died without heirs or representatives. Scott's mission was to document the traditions and manners of a vanished and vanishing Scotland. Red Gauntlet describes the old court of session which was swept away in a flood of innovation. Among the early changes, in 1808, Lord President Campbell of Succoth, an obstacle to reform, was shuffled out of office with handsome inducements. On Succoth's departure, the old session of the Hale 15, which had survived since 1532, was split into two divisions and the practice of entrants making their Latin harangue, as they called it, from the corner of the bench in the inner house while wearing a hat, as Fairford did in fiction and Scott did in real life, a relic of the medieval schools, was abolished in 1812. The digest title assigned to Scott in 1792 was Title 24, Book 48, De Cadaveribus Damnatorum. Scott dedicated his thesis to Lord Justice Clark Braxfield. The presentation copy, now in the Advocates Library, was gifted by a descendant of the original recipient. Scott's inscription asserts Scott's authorship, and you may be prepared to find confirmation in some creative touches added to the unpromising subject matter, the disposal of corpses of dead convicts. The thesis reminds us that De Cadaveribus is the foundation of our creed. Joseph of Arimathea, in accordance with the law of Rome, petitioned Pontius Pilate to release the body of the crucified Christ for burial. Thus, 
Christ came to be buried in the rock tomb belonging to Joseph, whence on the third day the resurrection occurred. This same Joseph, legend has it, brought with him to England the Holy Grail. The tradition is central to the story of the Knights of the Round Table, a tale first committed to print in Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur, 1485. Lockhart suggests that Scott was already studying Mallory at the time he presented his thesis. For many years, chivalry and medievalism defined Scott in the eyes of legal Edinburgh. In 1795, in proceedings against James Niven for the murder of the Faculty of Advocates barkeeper, or retired barkeeper rather, David Knox, we find junior counsel for the panel, Walter Scott, lecturing Lord Justice Clark Braxfield on the treatment of homicide by misadventure at jousting in medieval England. Scott kept returning to Mallory and he borrowed from Mallory for the title of the poem that put Loch Catrin on the tourist map, The Lady of the Lake, 1810. The Lady of Scott's title being Ellen Douglas, a Highland lass quite unlike the Arthurian enchantress. Ellen is best known for her prayer, Ave Maria. The prayer, translated into German, was set to music by Schubert. Trace a line of inspiration, if you will, back to De Cadaveribus Damnatorum. Scott's grandfather Rutherford, on his mother's side, was professor of medicine. The thesis tells us that Scotch practice innovates on the law of Rome by authorizing the court of justiciary to send the corpses of executed felons to the anatomy schools. One student thus advantaged was Charles, later Sir Charles Bell, remembered for pioneering neurosurgery and for his draftsmanship. On screen is a sketch of one of his soldier patients at Brussels in the aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo, 18th of June, 1815. By letter to his brother, George Joseph Bell, advocate and future professor of Scots law, dated 1st of July 1815. Charles Bell described his Flanders experiences. George Joseph passed the letter to Walter Scott and as soon as the court rose for the summer vacation, Scott was off to the Low Countries to see for himself. Scott's battlefield tour brought him into contact with a disgruntled Flemish farmer who intended to claim compensation from the English government for the destruction of his steading when Scott pointed out that the dilapidation had been caused by the French. The agriculturalist retorted that it was Wellington's fault because if the English had not blocked Napoleon's march to Brussels, there would have been no battle and no damage. Scott commented, quote, the Fleming, without having studied at Leyden, studied law at Leyden, that is, understood the doctrine of consequential damages. Now, this species of irony is a hallmark of Scott's imaginative writing. A knowing dialogue between the author and his readers passes over the heads of the characters in the plot. Would it be implausible to discern a note of characteristic irony in the dedication of Scott's thesis to Lord Justice Clark Braxfield, a hanging judge who, without appreciating his true function, was responsible for purveying cadavers to keep up the reputation of the Scotch medical schools?
Scott's irony was sharpened by his experience of litigation where the true significance lies in the exchanges between lawyers and judges talking over the heads of the litigants who mistakenly suppose themselves to be the protagonists. So it is in the case of Peebles against Plainstains, which features in Red Gauntlet. Peebles thinks himself a celebrity for the interminable process that has beggared him. Quote, to ken that nothing will be said or done among ah they grand folk for oors, save in what concerns you and your business. Oh man, nay wonder that you judge this to be earthly glory. To return to our litigious Fleming, it is easy to suppose that the issue was on the mind of Scott, Clerk of Session, for the reason that an important case decided in that summer term of 1815 was the consequential damages litigation about failure to deliver coffee beans, Dunlop against McKellar, clerked by the second division clerks in Scott's office. I mentioned Scott's law classes in 1791-1792. Scott attended 106 lectures given by Professor David Hume, advocate. Quote, I copied over his lectures twice with my own hand from notes taken in class, says Scott. And when I have had occasion to consult them, I can never sufficiently admire the penetration and clearness of conception which were necessary to the arrangement of the fabric of law. Two leather-bound volumes have come down. The first larger volume comprises notes on the law of persons and of things, and the second is concerned with the law of actions. The persons and things volume is a fair copy, as described by Scott. There are three points to notice. First, the fair copy notes are interleaved with blank pages for revising and updating. Scott's updates over a period of 14 years included decisions to 1806. This is concrete evidence of Scott's professional commitment and corroborates the declared value attached by Scott to Hume's exposition of the law which was like, quote, some ancient castle, partly entire, partly ruinous, partly dilapidated, patched and altered during the succession of ages by a thousand additions and combinations, yet still exhibiting with the marks of its antiquity, symptoms of the skill and wisdom of its founders. For Scott, Hume was the architect capable of analysing, quote, the various styles of the different ages and making the whole subject to, quote, a methodical plan. Scott was attached to the architectural metaphor. In Guy Mannering, the advocate Pleadle, remarks of the fine library he has collected, quote, these are the tools of my trade. A lawyer without history or literature is a mechanic a mere working mason. If he possesses some knowledge of these, he may venture to call himself an architect. Scott stretched the metaphor to illustrate the distinction between judge-made law, which he favoured, and codification. Of Napoleon's attempt, he wrote, The Code of France may be compared to a warehouse built with much attention to architectural uniformity, showy in the exterior and pleasing from the simplicity of its plan, but too small to hold the quantity of goods necessary to supply the public demand. While the common law of England resembles the vaults of some huge Gothic building, dark indeed and ill-arranged, but containing an immense store of commodities, which those acquainted with its recesses seldom fail to be able to produce to such as have occasion for them.
Scott's analysis was vindicated in a curious way. It turned out that the French Emporium was short of provision for les expulsions, summary evictions. The jurist Trelon, ultimately senior president of the Cour de Cassation, opined that the gap could be filled by the process described in Scott's Guy Mannering as, quote, a summary and effectual mode of ejection still practiced in some remote parts of Scotland. The process involved removing the thatch, the windows, the doors and hinges of the tenant's dwelling. In his textbook of 1852, title page now on screen, Trollon endorsed the practice generally under reference to Guy Mannering with the comment, literally translated, quote, the procedure is found in Scotland, in this country where there reigns to the highest degree a peaceful and moral spirit. What Trollon did not appreciate was that the eviction of the gypsy squatters of Dernkluch in Guy Mannering was not so much law as Scott's imaginative commentary on the Highland clearances. Returning to Scott's fair copy law notes, the second point of interest is that Hume gave a lesson in literary property, a lesson which was well remembered by Scott 40 years later. Third and last, there is nothing in the 1791 syllabus as noted by Scott about appeals to the House of Lords. 30 years later, later in the Stair Society edition of Hume's lectures, we find the professor making repeated references to the subject, something which came to engage Scott too, as we shall now see. Bride of Lammermoor tells of the tragic love affair between the dispossessed royalist Edgar, master of Ravenswood and Lucy, daughter of the Arrivist lawyer politician, Lord Keeper Sir William Ashton, a low church man. The castle and lands of Ravenswood have by questionable means in the court of session been forfeited to the Lord Keeper. You cannot address the Stair Society on Sir Walter Scott without talking about the bride. Why? Because our eponym is everywhere in this story. The change of regime at, castle, at the castle, armour sedant togai, is symbolised by the removal of the cavalier portraits and their replacement by pictures of Whig lawyers, my Lord Stair among them. The doomed love affair is based on a real-life event in Stair's family. Though Scott denied it, the character of the Lord Keeper is generally thought to be based on Stair, and Stair is the unnamed actor in the conundrum of the competing texts. Indeed, the Stair family plays a part, even under the seventh and eighth generations. Scott's own explanatory magnum note of 1830 includes a reference to the pre-Union Scottish judges, quote, much more distinguished for legal knowledge than for uprightness and integrity. This refers to our Viscount Stair, or Lord President Sir James Dalrymple as he then was, for the reference is followed by mention of the advocate strike of 1674. The originating cause was Stair's allegedly corrupt determination in the case of Lord Callender against the Earl of Dunfermline, 1674, together with his rejection of the supposed right to apply to Parliament for redress and his handling of the subsequent discontent, discontent among the bar. Things changed with the Williamite coup of 1689 when the claim of right entrenched, quote, 
the right and privilege of the subjects to protest for remit of law to the King and Parliament against sentences pronounced by the Lords of Session. Faced with this statutory imperative, the best that Stair could do was to argue in the second printed edition of the Institutions 1693 for a restrictive reading. The original 1819 text of the Bride places the action before the Act of Union of 1707. The text of the Magnum edition of 1830 puts the action afterwards. The change means that Ravenswood's threatened protestation for remit of law to the Scottish Parliament becomes a threatened appeal to the House of Lords. On screen is an example of Scott's manuscript revisal of the text for the 1830 edition. The redating allows Scott to use the fictional anxieties of Lord Keeper Ashton's circle as a vehicle for actual concerns about appeals to the House of Lords in the novelist's own day. The 1830 edition of The Bride has, quote, an appeal to the British House of Peers, described as, quote, a degradation of Scotland. The critical difference between protestations for remed and appeals is that the former did not automatically suspend execution of the interlocutor complained of, while the latter, for a century from and after the Greenshields case in 1711, did. As a result, appeals to the Lords multiplied. By 1806, the situation had reached crisis point, not at that stage, for the substantive law of Scotland. Decisions of the House of Lords were generally ignored but for the administration of British justice. Four out of five Lords' appeals came from Scotland and 200 Scotch appeals were in the backlog. There followed 20 years of initiatives to curtail appeals from the session to London. Scott had been gazetted Joint Principal Clerk of Session in Dalrymple's office on the 8th of March 1806, so not a lawyer, politician in Sir William Ashton's mould, but nonetheless during the initial phase of reform in the first rank of the supporting caste as a functionary and polemicist. At the faculty meeting of 28th of February 1807, the leading opponent, perhaps, of Lord Grenville's Radical Court Reform Bill, probably responsible, too, for getting the anti-bill speeches published. Secretary of the judge's delegation to the House of Lords during the Court of Session Spring Recess, 1807. Clerk to the Royal Commission for inquiring into the administration of justice in Scotland, established under Lord Chancellor Eldon's watered-down Judicature Act of 1808, clerking the Commissioner's meetings in Edinburgh and London through 1809 and 1810, and author of the anonymous article, View of the Changes Proposed and Adopted in the Administration of Justice in Scotland, in his own Edinburgh Annual Register for 1808, published in 1810. Scott is revealed as someone with a serious interest in the workings of the law and the way it shapes and is shaped by society. The immediate relevance of the 1810 article is Scott's repetition of the critique which he had first offered in 1807, namely that the remedy for the perceived mischief of too many Scotch appeals lay with the House of Lords and not in changes to the Court of Session. And so it proved from the mid-1820s with the professionalisation of appellate business in the Upper House. The landmark structural reforms of the Court of Session introduced by the, quote, respectful and lenient hand, to use Scott's words, of Lord Chancellor Eldon from 1808 did not apparently cause Scott anxiety for the future of Scott's law. <laughs>
The second phase of reform which focused on procedures was different. It saw Scott fulminating from the sidelines about, quote, the interference of these Englishmen with their periwigs and their parchment backs. That was in 1823 when the Royal Commission on the Forms of Process and the Course of Appeals to the House of Lords was set up. At the same time, another romance was in preparation, the novel to be published the following year as Red Gauntlet, in which the Jacobite, Hugh Red Gauntlet, mocks the Scottish advocates who tolerate the system of appeals to, quote, a foreign court. The Royal Commission's proposals were put into effect by the Judicature Act of 1825. Sir Walter Scott officiated at the Saturday sitting of the full court on the 12th of November 1825 when the related rules of court, about which he was later to express professional reservations, were appointed to be inscri inscribed in the books of Sederant. One particular litigation under the new dispensation and clerked by Scott was for Scott a disturbing portent of things to come. It took less than two years for the cause in question to go through the outer house and the inner house and to reach a determination in the Lords. The Lords overturned the decision of the First Division and remitted to the Lord President and his colleagues to consult with the Second Division as to whether the equitable English rule in Sitwell against Bernard should become part of Scots law. The First Division, let it be said, had already determined unanimously that, quote, to apply the English doctrine would be setting up a principle of equity against the intention of the testator. This decision of the Lords was pronounced on the 26th of May 1826, when the news reached Edinburgh, Scott made the following journal entry, quote, the consequence will in time be that the Scottish Supreme Court will in effect be situated in London, when then downfall as national objects of respect and veneration, the Scottish bench, the Scottish bar, and Scottish law itself. And there is an end of an old sang, where I, as I have been, I would fight knee deep in blood ere it came to that. But it is a catastrophe which the great course of events brings daily nearer. Fittingly, the case in question was John, 7th Earl of Stair, against the trustees of John, 6th Earl of Stair. And the decision, with the decision on a subsequent appeal to the Lords, 19th of June, 1827, and generally, an increasingly forward policy by their lordships in London was the background to the redating of the action in The Bride of Lammermoor, the tale so much bound up with the earlier history of the Stair family. <laughs>
to have been the seat of the famer. Skeen's drawings form the basis of Scott's description in the novel. The accused, the Earl of Oxford, a Lancastrian refugee from the Wars of the Roses going by the travelling name Philipson, is lowered blindfolded and bound to a pallet down a shaft and carried to the underground Hall of Judgment. The blindfold is removed in the light of flaming brands Philipson is charged by his hooded accusers with having slandered the fame by making remarks critical of its secret justice. Philipson pleads in defence that he is an Englishman, one accustomed to, quote, open-handed and equal justice. Now this, I suggest, is not to be dismissed as Gothic hokum. The plea, quote, I am an Englishman, importing due process rights, though anachronistic in the 1470s, resounds in English constitutional law. And we are at liberty to suppose, since he possessed the published trials of both Lilburn, 1649, and of Penn and Mead, 1670, that Scott knew this. By freeing the plea from its historical context, Scott opened the way for it to nourish the patriotic boast which resonated through the 19th century. Scott described his Femgericht as, quote, a secret combination, and his Femgericht was recognised as a metaphor, indeed was, I suggest, intended as such, in the aftermath of the debate about the combination laws, 1824 to 1825, with disorder persisting even in the Scottish borders, a metaphor, I say, for the imagined parallel justice system administered by working class associations bound together by illegal oath swearing and other paraphernalia of secret fili filiation. Writing about a homicide during the Glasgow cotton spinner strike of 1836, Thomas Carlyle declaimed, quote, what kind of wild justice, note the phrase, what kind of wild justice must it be in the hearts of these men that prompts them with cold deliberation in conclave assembled to doom their brother workman as the deserter of his order and his order's cause to die as a traitor and deserter and to have him executed like your old chivalry Femgericht and secret tribunal suddenly rising once more, not in the Westphalian forests, but in the paved gallow gate of Glasgow. So back to Scott and a favourite theme. Quote, the first object of civilization, he wrote, is to place the general protection of the law equally administered in room of that wild justice which every man cut and carved for himself according to the length of his sword and the strength of his arm. Rob Roy and the expedition against the McLarens. This brings us to our final novel, Rob Roy, 1818, which is full of wild justice. A significant republication occurred in the Magnum edition of 1829. Our final legal record is part of that 1829 text. For present purposes, the essentials of the Rob Roy plot are these. An English syndicate has invested in standing Highland timber. The London bank Osbolston and Tresham has issued bills in the amount of £5,000 sterling to pay for the woodlands. The bills are due for redemption on 12th September 1715. Rashley Osbolston, the nephew of the principal, has run off to the Jacobite camp in Scotland with the paper assets earmarked for redeeming the bills. If the bills cannot be honoured, the bank will fail. Frankus Bolston, son of the principal, pursues his cousin to Scotland 
into Rob Roy country to recover the paper for his father. Rob Roy country, because the outlaw Rob Roy is enlisted to help by a kinsman and intermediary, Bailey Nicol Jarvie of Glasgow. The story is so unusual that it must, don't you think, have some foundation in real life. The newly added 26,000 word 1829 introduction to Rob Roy is apparently factual with supporting historical documents. At one point, the introduction tells of the fatal shooting of John McLaren in 1736 by Rob Roy's son Robin Oig, and Scott then adds the note which is headed the author's expedition against the McLarens. The content is romantic, all the more so if assigned, as Lockhart assigns it, to a time when Scott was aged 15. Quote, the author is uncertain whether it is worthwhile to mention that he had a personal opportunity of observing, even in his own time, that the King's writ did not pass quite current in the Braes of Balwhidder. There were very considerable debts due by Stuart of Appin, chiefly to the author's family. They were likely to be lost to the creditors if they could not be made available out of this same farm of Invenenti the scene of the murder done upon McLaren. The McLarens declared they would not permit a summons of removal to be executed against them. An escort of a sergeant and six men was obtained from a Highland regiment lying in Stirling, and the author, then a writer's apprentice, was invested with the superintendence of the expedition. And thus it happened, oddly enough, that the author first entered the romantic scenery of Loch Catrin, of which he may perhaps say he has somewhat extended the reputation. Riding in all the dignity of danger with a front and rear guard and loaded arms. We experienced no interruption whatever and when we came to Invenenti found the house deserted. Now, given Scott's account of the literary consequences, it must occur that if we have the place, namely Invenenti, we can also hope to know from the court records the date, and thus the precise coordinates in time and space for the genesis of the literary genre known as the historical novel. I did say at the start, quote, if Scott's account can be relied on. Yes, there was a summons of removing, involving Scott Senior and Stuart of Appin's estate, but beyond that the court records the ones I have found at any rate, are at best equivocal. The shooting of John McLaren happened on Drumlich, a farm three holdings to the west. There had been no McLarens in Easter in Venenti, the proper name of the place, for a generation since 1750. The tenants were a family of Stuarts. The Stuarts were at home and the summons was served on them personally by a messenger at arms. Service took place on 9th May 1788, in the third year of Scott's apprenticeship, not the first. The Stuarts contested the removing by lodging defences in the Court of Session, and the end result was a compromise whereby Walter Scott W.S. bought out the tenants' interest. The tenants departed peacefully on or more likely shortly before 26 May 1790, and the new tenant and ultimate purchaser, the egregious Laird of McNab, then took entry unmolested. There was no Highland Regiment quartered at Stirling at the time, and the horse road from Stirling to Balwhida did not go by way of Loch Catrin. The farm was sold to the McNab, now on screen, in 1793. Years of litigation followed to resolve competing claims on the proceeds of sale. Young Scott was involved as an advocate when, on 7th July 1796, just before the long vacation, his father sent him into court to apply for reimbursement of his father's expenses. The resulting court order was in error, £20 short. There was no chance of correction before the down-sitting of the court again on 12th November. Young Scott's Edinburgh quarters were still under his father's roof in George Square and he had been involved in leaving his father out of pocket. Could our novelist 
really have forgotten the details of the case? That is not all. On 12th September 1803, William and Dorothy Wordsworth visited the burial ground at the head of Loch Catron, supposed to be the resting place of Rob Roy. The incident inspired William Wordsworth's poem, Rob Roy's Grave. On 13th September 1803, brother and sister hiked over the high ground between Loch Catron and the Glen of Balwida. Four days later, the Wordsworths breakfasted with Walter and Charlotte Scott at Lass Wade. Over the next week, they spent much time in Scott's company. Scott introduced the Wordsworths to William Laidlaw, the sheep farmer's boy from Yarrow, and the Wordsworths talked with Laidlaw about their respective experiences at the head of Loch Catron. Putting Dorothy Wordsworth's sketch map alongside her journal entry, the editor of the Yale edition concludes that she and William descended into the Glen of Balwida following the course of the Invernenty Burn, a route which took them down to our steading, where they asked for directions. Strange it is that there is no mention on either side of Scott comparing notes with his English guests. Clearly, there is scope for concluding that the Invenenti affair, as described in Scott's note, is, shall we say, highly imaginative. But if there is a fanciful element in Scott's supposedly factual introduction, there may also be a factual element in the avowedly fictional part of Rob Roy. A difficulty, though of a different kind, did occur. On the spring term day 1790, 15th May, when the legal paperwork was sent to the tenants for signature, Scott Senior also paid over £315 of his own money for the surrender of the tenancy, possibly assuming that the way going would take place immediately. The outgoing tenants had other ideas possessing, as they did, under a pre-1752 lease and being entitled under the old-style calendar to another 11 days in possession, that is until 26th May. Scott Senior, apparently fearful of a ruinous outcome, drew up a schedule of requisition and protest and sent it express to Dunblane. Question. What happened at and after Dunblane? I cannot yet say. But if the messenger continued to the braves of Balwida, he would likely have found the farmhouse, as Scott describes it, deserted. For we now know that the tenants had already signed the paperwork, though it hadn't yet been delivered. Let me ask. Who was this person who rode express to the Highland Line on 20th May 1790 to recover the paper on which the fortunes of Walter Scott W.S. depended? Was it young Walter Scott himself? Just as in Rob Roy, Frankel's Bolston in 1715 pursues those paper assets to the Highlands to prevent his father's ruin. So, Rob Roy and the Magnum edition of the Waverley Novels. I want to close by putting the Magnum Rob Roy in its legal context, for yes, it has a legal context. But first, note that the idea of a uniform collected works edition was hardly un unfamiliar to Scott. Scott had edited and annotated the collected works of two dead authors, Dryden in 18 volumes, 1808, and Swift in 19 volumes, 1814, both with biographical introductions, in a sense a model for what, what followed. In 1823, Scott's publisher, Archibald Constable, the Napoleon of books, made the revolutionary proposal that the living author, namely Scott, should edit and annotate a lifetime collection of his own works, revised. The project was christened the Magnum Opus. The Magnum project had barely started when, in 1826, 
the financial affairs of the participants fell into disorder. Once Scott's trustees and Robert Caddle had bought back the manuscripts from Constable's trustees on 19th December 1826, Cattle, now sole publisher, resurrected the scheme. The purpose was to activate the copyright extension for revised editions in terms of Queen Anne's Act 1710 as supplemented by the Copyright Act of 1814. Cattle reckoned on another 42 years of monopoly publication rights. Until this point, Scott was the unnamed, quote, author of Waverley. His public abandonment of the mask of anonymity at the Edinburgh Theatrical Fund dinner on 23rd February 1827, two months after the buyback of the manuscripts, was concerted in advance, it has been suspected, though Scott denies it, with his Parliament House colleague, the judge, Lord Meadowbank, the person who actually made the announcement. It was tied up with the issue of literary property. This was the understanding at the time of Harriet Arbuthnot, the Duke of Wellington's friend who wrote in her diary that it was, quote, in order to prove his right to the manuscript. The admission of authorship cleared the way for Scott to include autobiographical material in the magnum volumes, in the general preface, in introductions, in postscripts, and in author's notes. This conformed diffusely with the model of his Dryden and Swift editions. Indeed, an enterprising American gathered the material together and published it in 1831, before the novelist's death, as the autobiography of Sir Walter Scott. For Scott, it was a means of asserting that these were and had always been his texts. And so we find in one of the notes to the magnum Rob Roy, that reminiscence of Scott's apprenticeship, the author's expedition against the McLarens, with its explicit link to the author's creative process. To conclude, the magnum project takes us back in other ways to where we started, to Scott's origins in the law. In his lecture notes of four decades before, Scott had written down Quote, the author may at any time renew his right in the work by a new edition with alterations and additions, notes, etc., provided there is really new matter added. And so it came to pass with the magnum opus. Now, the magnum was worked up using a specially prepared, quote, interleaved set bindings for each title with blank sheets for Scott's manuscripts, quote, alterations and additions, notes, etc., interleaved between the pages of a previous printed version. On screen are facing pages from the interleaved magnum Rob Roy. Interleaving was not the innovation that some literature experts have supposed. The apparatus was clearly foreshadowed in the fair copy Scott's law notes of four decades earlier, as we have just seen. Where new material was too copious for the magnum interleaves, Scott wrote it on what he called papers apart, a term still used by Scotch lawyers when revising hard copy pleadings and writs. Here and there, the manuscript revisions made by Scott have another link back to the copy clerk beginnings a curly Q continuation mark at the foot of the page. On screen now is an example in the paper apart that continues the expedition against the McLarens. Quote, there goes the old shop again, Scott would reportedly exclaim when he found that he had unthinkingly added the flourish. And so, my lady, fellow members and guests, there goes the old shop, and there too goes my allotted time for sharing some thoughts on Sir Walter Scott, law and imagination. It is fitting to end with a continuation mark, for there is much more to be said, and much more will be said next year.
during the 250th anniversary celebration. In the meantime, I hope this foretaste has been of interest. Thank you for the privilege of this opportunity to speak to you and thank you for your attention.